Hello and welcome to Spotlight on Asia on Radio France International. I'm Rosalind Hyams. Sri Lanka's political climate continues to be stormy. The president, Madhripala Sirisena, suspended parliament at the start of the week after six Sirisena loyalist ministers in the so-called unity government under Ranil Wickremesinghe said they would quit the coalition along with ten pro-Sirisena parliamentarians. Sirisena almost immediately appointed acting ministers to replace those who resigned. The walkout followed Wickremesinghe's surviving a motion of no confidence tabled by the joint opposition and backed by Sirisena's ministers. Sirisena had previously demanded victory Vikramasinghe's resignation to allow Sirisena to appoint a prime minister of his choice. Relations between the rival groups in the unity government, Sirisena's left-leaning Sri Lanka Freedom Party, the SLFP, and Vikramasinghe's United National Party, UNP, and their respective supporters deteriorated after both suffered losses in local council elections in February this year. Since then, Sirisena has reduced the powers of the Prime Minister. In another turn of political events after the suspension of Parliament, Sri Lankan police on Monday arrested a leading dissident within the presidential party. A former sports minister was accused of spending government money to buy sports goods which were handed out in a bid to get support for former President Mahinda Rajapakse. Mahinda Alut Gamaji is a prominent figure in a faction that opposes Sirisena within the SLFP. That faction is led by Rajapakse who was in power for nearly a decade till he was defeated by Sirisena in 2015 and it was Rajapakse's faction that did well in the February local elections. Pakya Soti Saravanamutu is a Sri Lankan political scientist and co-founder of the Centre for Policy Alternatives in Colombo. He describes his view of the possible near-term political outcomes for the island country. In effect, the local government election results of the, of the 10th of February suggest that the Sri Lanka Freedom Party of Sivasena is in decline and the new party that has taken the vote base is the Sri Lanka People's Party under former President Rajapaksa. So the SLFP is in somewhat of a decline. As far as the UNP is concerned, they, are, they have problems with leadership. They have to, they're pledged to reform the party organization considerably, and that to be done by the end of the month. Um, and it's even conceivable that they would consider a new leader who would be the candidate in the presidential elections to happen in 2019. So at the present moment, the UNP seems to have somewhat of an upper hand. The party of the former president, Rajapaksa, the Sri Lanka People's Party, is the one that overall seems to have an upper hand, uh, but they too are somewhat stuck in terms of who would they put forward in a presidential uh, election uh, because President Rajapaksa constitutionally can't stand again and his younger brother, the defense secretary, is a dual national. He is also an American citizen and that has to be revoked before he can put forward his nomination papers. Did Sirisena have any other choice, do you think, than to to suspend parliament? No, I mean, I think the whole... The whole sort of crisis of government has been President Sirisena's, has been of his making. You know, the 10th of February, a local government election sent a stinging rebuke to the government of the day, but not a repudiation. But President Sirisena seemed to sort of take it as a repudiation and start shopping around for a new prime minister. And that's the crisis that has been unfolding ever since. You're listening to Spotlight on Asia on RFI with me, Rosalind Hyams. To Washington in the US and the hub of the Bretton Woods institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Trade war looming, the French economy minister Bruno Le Maire on Friday said France refused to enter into a trade war as US President Donald Trump seemed to be leaning towards a trade war with China. Le Maire was clear, Beijing must be part of constructive dialogue towards improving the state of the multilateral bodies. This was one of the comments he made when he spoke in English to Bloomberg TV in Washington on the sideline of these multilateral institutions' spring meetings. We have to engage China and we want uh, China to uh, abide by their international commitments. We want China to help us to build a new multilateral approach as far as trade is concerned. But the, the right solution is not to engage into uh, any kind of 
of uh, war against China. Now, what's that got to do with Sri Lanka, you may ask? Well, Sri Lanka has suffered because of Chinese economic policy, and depending on where you stand, that policy could be geostrategic also. In Beijing at the recent forum on the one trillion dollar China's Belt and Road Initiative to construct roads, railways, and other infrastructure across Asia, Africa, and Europe, the head of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, warned that the project could lead to other countries being saddled with what she called a problematic increase in debt. The principle is that the countries where the infrastructure is being installed pay for China's state-owned firms to build them with loans from Beijing. China says the loans are from banks, which do not depend on government subsidies, but also says that the loans are not wholly, entirely commercial either. Gareth Price, senior research fellow with Chatham House, spoke to us from Kathmandu in Nepal via an internet connection. When China held its, its major conference at the Belt and Road Initiative, most of the criticisms from both the European Union and India were on the grounds that you know either. The bidding isn't transparent. You know, there's no environmental standards. There's no assessments of whether this is going to work or not. So all the things that the Woods institutions have learned through sort of trial and error over the years, because only going back to the time before, where you just will lend you some money, build your port, and if it doesn't work, we'll take it over. As it seems Lagarde is concerned, the result can be that poorer countries have to pay so much debt service that they get caught in a debt spiral. In the case of Sri Lanka, Colombo ended up handing over a long-term lease on a strategic port, Hambantota, to China. It's now described as the emptiest international airport in the world. Very few ships visit the port. And it was part of quite a large debt that Sri Lanka owed to China. And in the end, Sri Lanka couldn't repay the debt because the assets were not viable and so now China has a national lease on the port and so there's, a, there's an interesting question I mean if you, if you talk to people in places that are very wary of China's motivations um, sort of India and Japan in particular the, the, the sense is that China's primary reason for Belt and Road Initiative is uh, the sort of geostrategic political clout and having ports and that sort of thing and I, I think it's, it's an interesting question it's, how paramount is the strategic plan and how much is it simply that China hasn't looked through the plans presented by other countries, you know, the pet projects of presidents in countries like Sri Lanka, where, you know, the airport and the port were both in his sort of his constituency and, and evaluated, are these actually going to work or not? The previous government in Sri Lanka was very much sort of in hock with um, China uh, and very happy to accept the loans. The subsequent government is not as pro-Chinese as the previous government, but it, it's left saddled with you know, these these debts incurred. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative, China's plans are not, you know, they're not being given as largesse. They're being given at commercial interest rates, you know, not dissimilar than those that other sort of bodies would give. And the difference in countries like Sri Lanka, certainly under its previous regime, is that less questions were asked. And that doesn't help Sri Lanka, but it also doesn't help the Chinese if it's looking for you know, the construction of economically viable infrastructure that's going to pay its way and so forth. And that raises the concerns in the countries that are skeptical of China. And, you know, Christine Lagarde's remarks sort of alluded to that. that you know, is this all basically about some sort of long term strategic plan? And it's not actually about the sort of you know, building up the economies of you know, countries in China's near and far neighbourhood in, in Asia and beyond. If China starts taking more due diligence, if China starts looking at what the sort of best examples are, this is how you make economic corridors work. This is how you make, you know, infrastructure project work. You know, there have been lessons learned. Sometimes they don't work, sometimes they do work. Now, if China starts to take some of these lessons on board seriously, I think we can say, OK, that's, that's quite positive. And if China continues to fund sort of the pet projects of local autocratic rulers, then that's much less positive. I'd like to thank my guests this week, Paikyasoti Saravanamutu in Colombo and Gareth Price in Kathmandu. And I'd like to thank you for listening. From me, Rosalind Hyams, until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.